Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who joined this uh, panel. As you know, we're going to talk about digitalization, which obviously is pretty significant at these times uh, during COVID, post-COVID, with social distancing and everything. And my name is Ganesh Nitrajan. I'm based in Pune in India, and I have the privilege of moderating this panel for all of you. And just as a quick opening remarks, I mean, I do a lot of work in the area of digital re-engineering, as we call it. All of us know about digital transformation, but we felt that through the research we were doing in various parts of the world, that one of the reasons why a lot of people were not succeeding in getting their act together on digital was because they still viewed it very much as a technology piece. And I'm sure all of you will agree that today, when you look at digital uh, companies or digital success stories, they've managed to do three or four things pretty well. First is, of course what everybody talks about, which is looking at customer journeys, employee journeys, every stakeholder, how do they really participate, interact with the firm? That's one. And include, that includes governments as well. The second, of course, is technology, because there are a whole bunch of core technologies which have become passe. But at the same time, there are a whole bunch of new edge technologies, whether it's Internet of Things, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, blockchains, and so on and so forth, which have become extremely critical. Then it comes back to the good old science of business process engineering, because if our processes are not optimized to leverage digital technologies, and indeed our processes are ancient as compared to the customer journey, then we lose synchronous with what the customer is expecting or what the technology can push us to. The fourth, of course, which I think has now become very uh, important and we're hearing phrases like data is a new oil, et cetera, et cetera. So I think everybody recognized data and big data as a key ingredient. We all went around creating our dashboards and business intelligence and so on and so forth. But it's only in recent times, thanks to significant advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, that we're now looking at the whole predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics as new ways of predicting behavior as well as interacting and giving opportunities for others. So I think those are the key elements. And business, I would say that Extremely important to look at digital identity, look at cybersecurity, which we will talk about a little bit on this panel. And last but not the least, culture. Because in many economies, we forget that we're dealing with very fifth generation technologies, sometimes with third generation processes, and very much first generation people. Because people who are not digital natives, they've been really digital immigrants, they're learning to use technology. And unless we bring up everybody up by upskilling, uh, reskilling, and of course, the whole culture building to a common framework, we will probably not leverage the power of digital that much. Better. So let me stop here by saying digitalization is here to stay. How well you are able to adapt to digital, you probably find this new success stories during COVID and definitely post COVID. And we really are to understand various facets of looking at digital to make ourselves successful. So what I'm going to take you, uh, what I'm going to do in the next maybe uh, 25 minutes is to take you on a journey. We'll start by talking a little bit about Industry 4.0 and how the manufacturing organization really look at digital. We'll move on to data and data futures, I think, which is very, very important. We'll explore a little bit about completely new technologies, virtual reality, which is catching the imagination of the world by storm, and I think virtual conferencing, which most of us are experiencing today. And then we'll move on to the concept of digital identity and discuss how that can affect the success or failure of your digital experiments. And finally, of course, we will talk about digital platforms and maybe look at a few case studies internationally on how to make that happen. I have, as I said, a very exciting panel, and I'm going to start with Lawrence and ask Lawrence to talk to us a little bit about Industry 4.0 and, and the imperatives for implementation. Each of our speakers will, will speak for about four to five minutes. And after, after we finish, we take whatever questions come in from the audience or any other questions anybody may have. And we'll, this is the way we spend the next 40 minutes. So thank you very much. And over to you, Lawrence. Yeah, thank you, everybody. So my name is Lawrence Conrad. I'm German, but I live in Japan since almost 20 years. And I started here actually as a representative of Fraunhofer. It's Germany's biggest uh, um, research organization for applied industrial research. And they are actually the drivers of Industry 4.0. And uh, since seven years, I work for AIST. It's a Japanese national research center for advanced industrial science and technology. And uh, five years ago, we started AI Research Center. And uh, this 
goes into a similar direction. And uh, besides that, also I represent a German software company, Contact Software. Uh, it's not as big as uh, Mohit's uh, software company, <laughs> but uh, they are specialists in digital twins, which is actually uh, the digital model uh, of uh, machine or factory and the basis of digitalization. And um, coming to industry for zero, it means basically the um, digitalization of industry. And uh, it uh, it appeared in Germany. In Japan, we have so-called society 5.0, and the Japanese have the view on the society and say it's not only industry, um, in Germany also more than industry, but uh, uh, the whole society will change. Also, so social processes will be um, will be data gathered uh, through uh, sensors and then analyzed by AI and then again feed back to the society. And um, if I now think of COVID, actually we experience that we are all working in the cyberspace. So we are sitting in front of computer and all the work is done in computers, but those are not really linked with the real space because or with the, the reality, the reality um, processes work still very conventionally. In Japan, we use faxes, for example. And um, uh, so this this hasn't yet changed. So uh, my... my uh, idea is actually if we change now or if we invest money now we should really invest this into digitalization because it will come anyway so industry 40 society 50 will come and will change also the whole process of things we are doing and uh, also i think the next challenge uh, will be the so after after corona the next challenge we have is the uh, global warming and also for the renewable energy, which also our institute is doing a lot, uh, you need digitalization. You have to uh, compensate the fluctuations of renewable energies and uh, you have to distribute this. So it doesn't work without uh, digitalization. So uh, my final uh, talk is a little bit like... Um, so we have Industry 4.0, in Japan we have Society 5.0, and uh, there is a guy, Jeremy Rifkin, he actually says we will have the third uh, <laughs> revolution. He looks onto the um, efficiency, and the whole uh, economy gets to a higher efficiency level. He says when communication, transport, and uh, um, uh, yeah, communication and energy is going to a next level. So in the 19th century, we had uh, cheap coal, we had steam power, so we had mechanization of uh, production. In the 20th century, we had oil, we had uh, also electricity, we had power plants, and we had cars for, um, uh, for the mobility. And uh, he says now we are going to the next step, we, we, which will be actually uh, powered by renewable energy, but it only works as an internet, internet of renewable energy. We will have, of course, automated transportation internet, and we will have the internet of things, uh, which is the um, digitalized production. So in that sense, I think we have to digitalize, we have to go into renewable energy, and all that also fits well together. Thank you, Lorenzo. Just a quick question for you, because, I mean, we all know that the large corporations, whether it's Siemens or ABB or any of those, they've really taken on to smart manufacturing and digital twins and digital, I mean, Industry 4.0. What do you think are the challenges for smaller companies? Because in India, we're finding that a lot of small, what we call SMEs, mm. don't con because they don't know where to start. So what's your, what's your view on that? Yeah. Yeah, basically, digitalization is also can also be done in small steps. Uh, so here in Japan, there is an example of a machine tool maker that, uh, that puts an iPhone onto the machine, and the iPhone has a vibration sensor, and this mm -hmm. already gives additional information about the machine that helps him um, maybe to to detect some defect or things like that. So. 
uh, in in Germany and Japan we have the same situation. So small companies uh, in Japan there are also quite small ones. They have one or two machines and they work with the family and so on. So of course they cannot uh, throw everything out and buy new stuff. So digitalization has to be done in small steps and it can be done in small steps. So yeah. Great. Thank, thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lorenz. Okay, we'll move to Osama. Osama, you you also mentioned uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon of you know, data that you're working with. So maybe for our audience, can you just talk a little bit about what you, how you look at data, and how can people who are digitalizing really leverage data much better than maybe they are today? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. This is uh, Osama Fayyad. I'm. Uh, uh, Chairman and CEO of Open Insights, a uh, company that actually works with uh, big data and AI, uh, mostly helping companies kind of understand and, and manage their data as assets. Um, I probably want to share um, maybe three major observations that, that we're seeing that kind of speak to the state of digital as, as we see it. Um, uh, observation number one is, uh, People's approach to digital has historically been um, to basically take workflow processes and spend energy digitizing them. And I think uh, a lot of companies and, and organizations are realizing as they do that digitization with the focus on automation, they uh, implicitly and without realizing it are losing uh, a lot of information that's essential to them. So what I mean by this is um, you know, if you're doing, if you're interact, if you're a customer interacting with a bank, um, while it's expensive to go to a branch for the bank to to uh, support a branch and have you interact with a branch and people and or or do a phone call, um, they were actually getting information about you. So, for example, you know, what do you need? Who are you? Uh, what are your concerns, etc. They're also um, that information once you go digital. Uh, gets lost uh, because most companies haven't thought through the data side of the equation and the fact that as you lose these senses, you kind of, uh, I call it typically, you you know, digital can lead to blindness. You lose that ability to understand what customers uh, want, who's getting the service they need and who's not, why are they not getting it, who are they going to if they're leaving you, why are they coming to you if they're coming to you? So a lot of information, rich information gets lost. It was never formally kind of collected, but it was there organically. Uh, and suddenly, at least we see many companies that effectively have to redo their digital uh, thinking about what data do I need to collect, how to collect it, how to manage it, and how to use it, kind of understand what's going on. So that's phenomenon number one. Uh, phenom phenomenon number two uh, has to do with Kind of the ability to digitize so especially with covid everybody was pushed and and many kind of uh, late adopters became early adopters honestly because they had to into digital and i think most companies adopted or adapted also to figure out how to make digital work for their internal uh, workflow uh, and, and 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 work organization so internally to a company uh, People have found it surprisingly easy to go digital in most cases. Um, what has not been solved yet is there is no story thought out around kind of how uh, cross-company collaboration can happen. So companies like us who work with a lot of uh, customers, uh, other clients, etc., well, we've been able to launch, thankfully, many projects remotely, which is something I thought would be very, very difficult. Uh, when it comes to actual implementation, when it comes to having access to infrastructure at a client's company, when it comes to uh, an ability to test things, replace things, etc., uh, companies are extremely challenged uh, because uh, you know they basically figured out how to make, how to give access to their own employees and maybe in some cases to their call center people, but they haven't figured out how to give access to partners. So that interaction hasn't been solved digitally. Uh, uh, and the third one, which is very, very related, and is my last point, uh, lies with cybersecurity, right? So a lot of, uh, uh, in fact, I would say most uh, approaches to cybersecurity have been based on protecting a perimeter. And that perimeter has effectively disappeared. When people no longer work in 
specific physical locations with specific physical devices and are now working from home and in fact from anywhere, that perimeter kind of becomes very diffuse and in many cases disappears. So their ability to adapt, adapt to that has been uh, very, very difficult. Uh, the, other, uh, the other side of it, uh, the side of this coin, is many of the tools that are built for this um, actually don't react well. So basically people monitoring or trying to do security uh, are they were before overwhelmed with false alarms to begin with. So, you know, if you're in a security operations center, your biggest problem is overwhelming false alarms and where do you pay your attention? Now it's gone kind of exponential. Uh, and by the way, uh, uh, just uh, reiterating on Lorenz's point, if you go to the world of IoT, that's a world where yeah, the perimeter is way more diffuse and even basic things like <clears throat> if you're a device, how do you know who do you report to? Who can you trust? What other devices are okay versus not? What is identity in IoT? All of that is is, a, is rife with unsolved problems. So we are forging ahead into the digital world, but a lot of very basic things are coming up and, and facing us, at least in what we see. And most of them have to do with data, in my opinion. But Osama, you mentioned that, you know, the whole perimeter issue, which is so important. But I mean, if you look at it, the whole world is talking about I mean, open data policies in government and you know, data sharing, etc. And on the other hand, as you rightly said, I mean, data security is becoming a big deal. So where do you draw the line? I mean, between I mean, literally opening up your APIs, opening all your data to the public, vis-a-vis -vis making sure so the core crown jewels are secure. So I mean, how do how do how do you suggest people or organizations think about it? Yeah, it's a it's actually a very difficult and, and deep question and. Uh, you know, there is a. Uh, in fact, we worked with several, we work with several governments where they they actually take um, the stance that uh, by default uh, data is public, right? Um, and that's a nice philosophy, but when you get into the details, um, it becomes really really tricky, right? So yes, maybe I would like to share data. I, I'll use some innocent examples. I'd like to share data on traffic, uh, traffic violations. Um, you know, how, how are things working? Where are the bottlenecks? But that same data, if you drill down deeper, uh, will include data that might say that, um, hey, such and such a person got a violation for such and such a thing or had these other people in the car when they did this accident or what have you. So you, you cross that line between privacy and in many cases secrecy and kind of data available for, for public use uh, very, very quickly. Uh, companies are also challenged because they definitely want to share. I mean, a, an asset that uh, that you can't share is, is not quite an asset, especially with, with your partners, etc. cetera. Uh, but they're very um, confused as to how to do it without risk. And often risk will freeze will freeze that, that asset uh, inside. So the, the recommendations we make are, they really have to do with thinking through, and this is another deep topic, uh, there are ways to share without necessarily sharing details. Uh, you know, there are approaches, you know, I'm on the advisory board of a company called Leap Year that uh, specializes, for example, in differential privacy. So how do you make data sets available uh, without an ability to discover kind of the details of individuals, but with guarantees, mathematical guarantees that you get the same results at an aggregate level when you're trying to do studies and or uh, look for patterns. Um, that is actually, it turns out, uh, one of the biggest things companies need to think about internally as well. So within a company, and that's another philosophy that's proven broken, right? If you look at um, uh, data breaches and, and, and issues like that, you will find that the majority of breaches are actually internal. They're not external hacking and stealing data, although those happens. Much, much larger is, you know, an employee gets socially engineered or... Uh, an employee goes bad or goes rogue and you have a major leak, right? And basically that, that should prompt companies to think really hard, like who inside the company? It's not a, a mag magical kingdom where anybody inside the walls is trusted. Who inside the company should really, really have access? How do I restrict that to a minimal set of people that I monitor and watch carefully? And then my normal employees, they don't need access to that detailed data. They can be operating at that protected level. So that's another kind of um, philosophy of thinking that many organizations uh, don't think about. It includes data sharing and data use. 
Uh, I do believe that fundamentally we need to think about data as a, as a sensitive resource at all levels, internal and external. Well, I like your terminology called socially engineered employees. No yeah. that. <laughs> okay, I think, I think we have one speaker missing. I'm not too sure Stefano has joined yet. But I think then in that case, we'll move to Rob. And Rob, I think you're going to talk to us about digital identity, which in the context of the data discussions we just had is probably most critical. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, greetings, uh, everybody, wherever you are in the world from a sunny Ireland, which is unusual. Normally it's raining here um, and, and a little bit chilly today, but um, yeah, it, it's it's a good day. Um, some of the points that Usama touched on there are, are hugely interesting to me. Um, my business is, is all about digital identity. Uh, it's about, um, you know, who you are, uh, who companies are, who things are. It's all about the identification of, of stuff. Um, and what we've seen uh, over the last six months or so since COVID has, uh, has arrived um, is actually an acceleration um, by companies and governments to really start looking at what do we need to do to get our, uh, our customers, our citizens, our residents moving into a fully digital um, capability so that they're able to interact with all of the services uh, and things that they need without necessarily having to go, for, you know, in a face-to-face -face, um, interaction. And it, it's, it's accelerated to the point where it's no longer a choice for companies. It's an imperative. They, they have to do it. And governments have finally realized that um, they are integral to the success of making this happen um, because they sit on so much data that is critical to making um, services and applications uh, work properly. Um, you know, we're working right now with um, the British government uh, around uh, using passport data, for example, to, to identify people for financial services. And this will be the first application where um, the passport, which is essentially a travel document, um, will be used for a non-travel application. So using it for financial services, uh, you know, to identify yourself. And again, moving from a document world to a data world. So we're able to have APIs that connect directly to an authority uh, that will validate something uh, for an organization in order to provide some form of a service. And I think what we're going to see over the next period of time is um, roots of trust. Uh, what I mean by roots of trust is organizations that are fundamentally authoritative um, becoming really foundational in the creation of the digital economy and the digital society that we're now going to start seeing this rapid transition towards. And COVID actually has, has accelerated it. Uh, you know, listening to, to Lorenz earlier, I used to live in Japan many years ago and, you know, there's a, a word in Japanese called kiki uh, and it's made up of two, two characters. Um, you know, one of them is opportunity and the other one is crisis. And depending on, on how you view COVID, for some it's a crisis, but for others it's an opportunity. And I think um, you know, if you want to grasp the opportunity uh, and, and look at it, we're, what we're seeing and we have seen over the last six months, where we were originally focused on financial services, we've seen inquiries from healthcare providers, education providers, um, obviously financial services, but governments as well, uh, who want help to be able to join things up in a manner that doesn't compromise the security of the data, uh, the right to privacy of the individual, um, and, you know, building on what Usama was saying, these are some really challenging things that um, the world of identity is struggling with right now is, you know, an organization might have to comply with a law that says, I, I need to identify you. Um, but there may be another law somewhere else that says you can't share that information. You're not allowed to do it. So you've got these conflicting legal structures uh, in, in uh maybe a single jurisdiction or in multiple jurisdictions where you've got this cross-border conflict. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've seen here in Europe very recently um, as a consequence of a, a European Court of Justice ruling where there was data sharing 
um, between the EU and the United States, uh, particularly focused on Facebook, for example, where uh, data was moving and they basically said the, the transfer of this data was unlawful, um, which creates a whole lot of problems for all of the organizations that are now moving information uh, from you know one jurisdiction to, to another. How do you deal with that? And how do you associate the rights of the individuals and the companies to do what they need to do um, in a in a in a context like that? Um, so there's there's a whole ton of uh, a ton of reasons why um, you really need to start thinking about the detail uh, in terms of all of the elements that go into the digitization of of these processes and the identification of of individuals. One area that I think is going to be very important is privacy. Um, I remember when I started um, my work on this oh, seven, eight years ago, everybody said to me at the time, forget about it. Privacy is dead. Uh, nobody's ever going to care about privacy. Uh, and I said, you're wrong. It, it's one of these things. It's a little bit like insurance. Um, you only realize you need it when you've lost it um, and your house is burned down and it's gone. And what we've seen over the last three years or so is a slow shift where, and maybe it's accelerating, where people and organizations are really that, re realizing that privacy actually is very important. Uh, and my ability to control my information in the manner that I deem appropriate for me. Um, and it's not uh, necessarily right that, you know, Facebook or Google or Apple or Amazon, whoever it is, um, is able to hoover up all that information and do whatever they want with it. Um, there was a, a document published, I don't know if anybody saw it over the last few days, um, again, by the European Commission called the European Digital Services Act. And there's some very radical thinking in there, which is, you know, Facebook or Google will not be able to use the data that they capture on you to provide a commercial service unless they make that data available to others to provide similar services, which means the wall garden of all the data that these companies um, has been collecting is coming down um, in order to level the, the playing field and make it more democratic as to how uh, all this information flows. But again, fundamentally with all of this is how do I bind all that to a person? Um, how do I connect it all? Who ultimately is in charge of it? So this is a massive area that I, you know, I'm, I'm really delighted that the conversation is, is coming around to um, at a government level, at a real decision maker level, how we generate policy around this, because it is fundamental to our lives going forward. No, but that's a little scary, isn't it? I mean, if you authorize Facebook to not only take your data and use it, but also share it with all competitors and collaborators, I mean, it's becoming worse than not having data security. Well, I think what they're trying to get at is you can share it with with uh, other organizations who will collaborate, but with your consent. So they're trying to to build in a sort of three sided model where you've got Google, the service provider, and and the individual whose information it is, so that you've got um, the ability to permission things and the ability to um, you know remove those consents whenever you you think it's right to do it. Now, there's a paradox in in a lot of this in, in the Many people will say, you know, I want to be able to control my information. But when you actually give them control, they go, I don't want to do that. That's going to take me forever because I've got so much information out there. Uh, you know, if I looked at my own situation, I've got thousands of places that I've given information to. I don't want to manage all of that. What I would love to do is, you know, give it to Mohit's company or somebody to say, look, you have managed this for me. I'm happy to trust you to do it. And here's a general set of rules that I would like you to use in order to do that. And I might pay you a small fee to do that, or a service provider might pay a fee to do that. And I think we're starting to see these commercial models starting to appear that will allow these um, services to be delivered in a manner that is beneficial to both the consumer, the citizen, and the business and the government. So everything is being sort of balanced and properly aligned. So, Ganesh, if you're okay, I had a question for uh, for yeah, Rob. Please. Uh, and, and Rob, uh, you know, this is a fascinating topic, right? The whole question of identity, uh, as you rightly said, in the pandemic has become even more pronounced and elevated, the degree of importance that it has. From a personal perspective, I actually uh, renewed mortgage in my house in April, and I was able to do everything digitally, including you know, proving my identity. 
My question to investors across the world: There are really three models for who will, uh, you know, be the central provider of that identity as a service. You know, it biometrics to validate your identity. Will it be the banks or insurers because they have a deep interest as well uh, in staying at the center of your financial life, or is it going to be big tech? Uh, which one of these three, or, or maybe it's only somebody else, which one of these three organizations do you think is best placed uh, to provide uh, an identity-based uh, service? You've got a couple of startups like you know, you've got Digi Identity in the you know in Europe. You previously had Barclays and I think Experian providing it. You've got a post office providing it in the UK. Uh, who do you think are the likely winners in providing this identity service? It's an excellent question, uh, uh, and I think time will tell <laughs> where where it goes. But I, I actually think what we're going to see is almost like the Internet of Identity, where it will be decentralized, and you will go to certain organizations for certain things. So I, it won't be a bank owning everything, or it won't be Facebook owning everything. It'll be context based and for the particular um, service or whatever that you, you need to consume. Um, in, you know, just for a financial service, for example, I might need to prove my um, my identity, official identity with a government ID. So I go to the government for that bit. I might need to prove ownership of a mobile phone. So I go to my phone company for that. I might need to prove address. So I might go to a utility for that. What we need to have is a mechanism that allows the interactions to take place at a data level between you, the service provider, and all of those different organizations in a manner that preserves the privacy, confidentiality of the transaction. So again, what Usama mentioned earlier, um, again, is this company that he was working with, we do something very similar, which is using cryptography to allow confirmation of things to take place without the necessity to share the information. So nothing is being uh, exposed or um, or People's privacy rights are not being breached, but you're still able to get confirmations of, uh, around various things, which allows um, networks to be created without necessarily having to aggregate or pool lots of information. That, that's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, Mohit, over to you. So, I mean, maybe you can just give us a larger worldview of what you see from an Infosys point of view. And also, of course, I mean, the very hot topic of digital platforms, we could touch upon both. Thank you, Ganesh. So I think, look, uh, overall, uh, as the entire panel, uh, you know, uh, Lorenz, uh, Rob, and Kusama, everybody has said that uh, the pandemic has really provided a huge opportunity from a digital perspective. And it is every single, you know, digital is obviously a very broad brush term. Uh, but as I think about digital in terms of, you know, for me, the five key components, the experience piece, the data piece, the innovation piece, which is a lot around IoT and vertical platforms. Uh, the cloud and the API piece and the cyber security piece it has resulted, I think, in a burst of investment across all of these five categories. Clearly, some organizations have done better than others. Uh, if you were to pick a rule of thumb, larger companies have done better than uh, smaller and medium-sized companies. And I think there is a growing realization that that digital is going to be potentially a only shop front uh, in the future. And there is the need to cater to the shop front, so investments from a customer perspective, but there's also a need to cater to uh, digital from an internal employee perspective. Right? I think there was a discussion, uh, I think Osama had made the point around how important it is to not just guide the firewall you know, that's protecting the company from the external world, but also internally to set up a series of uh, staggered and staged firewalls so that information is protected, that uh, your internal employees to have access to the best tools possible. So. We see this investment in technology and investment in digital as speeding up remarkably over the next couple of years. Uh, I think the results that you've seen from uh, you know from the providers of uh, services, especially in a B two B context like a Salesforce or a Microsoft, have uh, you know have shown how huge the market thinks the potential is. And to a degree, even if you see our results, they have shown that uh, corporate interest in additional provision of digital technology is huge. So. Digital, both from a cost perspective and from an experience perspective, I think is going to remain very significant. 
the uh, question of platforms here now i'm talking about platforms in a fairly limited capacity i'm talking about digital platforms when we think about platforms we think about mostly sort of you know facebook uh, google style uh, you know uh, business to consumer uh, based platforms i'm thinking more here about b2b style platforms uh, what we are seeing increasingly is that businesses are moving from you know from more linear businesses to more platform businesses and when we try to define what platforms would mean in our context uh, look historically we've been a services company that has had software assets as well uh, but increasingly uh, we see the platform economy as being a significant part of our future not our entire future but part of our future and so the terminology understanding what platforms mean in an inclusive context is important for us and the way we look at it is there are four broad categories right i think the first is purely uh, technical platforms right and these are mostly like tools or uh, uh, developmental uh, uh, platforms that you can use to really create an end product right uh, so that's a very very narrow field you know uh, there's not very much of a focus on that the second is uh, you know business application platforms which is uh, like a salesforce style uh, platform where you're creating a uh, essentially a piece of software which is multi tenant uh, which is cloud native uh, which is highly automated uh, which has wonderful experience uh, which has uh, you know huge ai capability uh, to provide specific services to companies and in this context we felt that a lot of the software that we had like a finical for instance you know it's the banking platform used by a billion people has historically been an on prem software this opportunity to convert that into a uh, business applications platform there's also a business process platform there's a third category where we can provide the the application platform and the underlying uh, you know bpm or bpo capability as well and we realized that we had this in the mortgage servicing uh, joint venture that we had with abn so there's a software capability but there's also the uh, you know the mortgage servicing operations capability behind that and finally you have what i call the true uh, two sided platforms which is a space that we haven't entered yet so from an emphasis perspective the focus is very much on business service platforms which have a bpm component and on the business applications platform which are more like a saas based platforms so once we identified that this is an opportunity we looked at what do we have internally that allows us to you know to grow in this space what are the technical capabilities that we need in each of these platforms what are the some of the business capabilities that we need in these platforms and then within the organization working to create a set of playbooks so there is a common and consistent uh, experience across platforms from a pricing perspective from a technology roadmap perspective from a you know onboarding and migration perspective so it's an important space for us so we feel that this can become a significant component of our business both the business applications and the business services uh, platform uh, and one piece of it i think the second piece is once we created this capability and you know it's more of a thought process because a lot of the underlying components already there we found that it was very attractive even to clients who are looking to create in house only platforms because technology has advanced so quickly and you would see this in the recent partnership we announced with vanguard to really create a next generation red keeping platform uh you know which is cloud native uh, which is uh, you know largely open source based uh, which is Uh, microservices based this is going to be a proprietary platform that will be dedicated to uh, you know to vanguard only but the fact that we had such significant capabilities in creating population scale platforms really made it very attractive to them even if we were building something for them. so the tools and the you know techniques and the tricks of uh, the platform trade are going to be very useful even in a services context and creating that uh, you know uh, that understanding of what it is that constitutes a true platform what are some of the technology standards that you need to have what are some of the business playbooks that you need to have i think are an important arsenal for us as we uh, look at our future the advantages are also very significant right? there is a pricing advantage there is a uh, you know there is a huge amount of stickiness and there is the possibility that many of these and some of them already are like starter and pinnacle are in a degree already multi tenant platforms the opportunity to create truly multi tenant platforms for the b2b space So let me let me put you a bit on the spot, Mohit. I mean, if you look at the let's say the companies or the or the clients of the future, would they prefer to work with a very strong, high quality services play like an Infosys or a Tata's, 
or would they rather go to a palantir or a globant who are very unique niche solutions in digital or would they work with a multi tenancy platform company i mean do you think people will make choices like that look i think uh, you know it is an arms race and it is an arms race not so much between the two groups that you mentioned because palantir quite honestly to a large degree is a services company globant uh, is a you know services company so are infosys and tcs i think it's a race between the hyperscalers right between the amazons aws uh, sorry aws azure and uh, gcp and between the services companies does it happen that tomorrow uh, you know uh, a jp morgan or a city bank says that i don't want to work with anybody else i will only work with google and uh, and amazon and everybody else come behind them right so it's a question of whether google and aws can build domain level capabilities and application capabilities uh, you know fast enough or whether we can expand on what we're doing i mean a lot of the stuff that i spoke about right the finishing capability the startup capability is building such a deep domain expertise that we can then say that to go back to a jp morgan or city and say you don't worry about who is behind our application whether we use google for computer or we use aws for computer is relevant to you you just look at what our application can provide in terms of functionality so whether they become domain rich quicker then we can become cloud agnostic i think is the question that's a very interesting point okay i think okay folks we have just 4 minutes left so i'm going to ask you one question that came from suveer malani so suveer asks this the very interesting question always he says how about a hybrid approach of a digital and human touch i mean which i think a lot of us are worrying about especially with automation and ai so would any of you like to answer that question do you do you see the role of the human being disappearing over a period of time or will it evolve and change into something else i mean i'll i'll take a i'll take a quick whack at it yeah i mean there's many there, there's many uh, i mean at the end of the day the service has to be rendered to a human and a human has to <laughs> experience something so for sure um for sure that's always going to be central in fact i, I would add an even stronger point uh, there is an ambition in many companies to through automation to add a lot of ai and of course there's two things i always say about ai number one is um without the right data no ai works but number two which is more important even there is no autonomous ai like the only ai that works is that kind of hybrid or experiential ai where human is in the loop and the machine is doing kind of the heavy lifting that machines do well while the human can do that uh, real time judgment adjustment to changes and common sense reasoning that no machine so far can have so this this hybrid world uh, is here to stay and in fact it's a it's a you know it's a must that we 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 have to figure out how to make it work both on the digitization side as well as on the service and exp- uh, customer experience side what's your view rob no i would agree i think it's absolutely critical that the human is involved in the process um you know when when we start letting machines r- rule the roost and and they become you know com- completely in charge of everything we sort of l- lose sense of purpose um and and i think you know as you some just said the 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 reasoning that that um we as humans apply to things um we can't lose that we've got to build this into the into the process and i think that you know ultimately um our our existence as humans involves us to participate um and i i don't want to live in a world that is dominated entirely by software and machines and what not i i want the humanity and you know just on a personal level i'm really sad that i'm not sitting beside you all uh you know instead of talking through a screen i would like to see you and you know shake hands with you and do all of these things so um for me that's very important and i don't want to lose that great i i i'm sorry we really are running out of time so i'll just take a maybe half a half a minute to summarize i think it's been a fantastic journey that we've all been on and i kind of totally agree with the, all the dimensions that we have to think about worry about and i really love what both of you said at the end saying that look at the end of the day this world is created by human beings and it's probably meant for human beings so i think augmented ai or 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 maybe assistive ai is probably the way to go and especially i mean given the covid situation and the post covid i think we're all going to be worried about jobs about wages so i think we have to be a little thoughtful in how we use digital having said that i think there's no doubt that digitalization is the only way to go so if somebody is still fence sitting 
please go ahead and make it happen and hopefully this panel help thank you very much gentlemen and it was a really pleasure talking to you thank you thank you thank, thank you very you. much thank bye you. bye everyone bye <laughs> to take care of uh, ai uh, <laughs> or so maybe so we are still I'm so sorry, so sorry, poor Stefano could not join at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't happen. It's crazy. Yeah, okay, folks. I had some I, I, things yeah. to to Rob actually. Um, looking at the uh, the data, uh, this is also a big topic now. So I'm I'm working between Europe and uh, and Japan. So we had uh, some research proposals with uh, UK companies uh, and, uh, of course, French, German, and so on. Uh, in one month will be um, the Japanese, German, French AI symposium. And uh, what we always say is uh, basically Europe and Japan are very similar concerning data uh, protection and data privacy. And uh, this is actually also what companies need. If companies uh, uh, digitalize all their business, they don't want uh, uh, they don't want uh, big IT giants to you know to have all the data or process all the data. And uh, so we have basically two big giants in the AI sector: it's China and US. And uh, of course, in US, we have this. Um, this uh, surveillance capitalists. <laughs> I recently read this uh, this very interesting book, but I, th I see there is now also more discussion there about uh, about privacy. So I think it will take some time until it uh, gets to uh, maybe maybe sound levels. But I think basically that's the the main topic, and um, I, I always see Japan and Europe is very similar in that respect. I, I agree, and I think you know it's actually spoken to some senators and Congress people in 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 the U.S. government, and it's actually one of the things that the Democrats and the Republicans agree on is the need for privacy controls around how data is used. So, you know, depending on I don't it doesn't matter who the next president is, one of the things that you might actually see come out of the Congress is. Um, agreement on more privacy controls at a federal level um, as to how, you know, data is to be used and consumed by, by business generally. So it, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank, thanks. thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. for Rob. Pleasure to meet you all. <laughs> Pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah, so, thanks a lot. It was interesting and just too short, I think. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, let's keep contact.